observation and latterly being with, which is an extension to participant observation. It was created in the form of ethnographic style vignettes and I adapted that process of creating those vignettes to suit my neurotype. So I made adaptations to allow me processing time to take in what had happened before writing the detailed note and I also adapted how long I spent in the field with respect to my neurotype. Um, but the first phase of data analysis was within the creation of my field notes because I would go into the field for two, three hours and then as soon as I came out or as soon as I had buffered all the information upon coming in, out, I would write a detailed account of what had happened in the field. And as I was writing that, I would reflect on what had happened in the field and add that reflection to the account. So that reflection is the first stage of analysing what happened. And then I would um, go away and, you know, there would be a week before I was back in the field again. And during that time, other thoughts would occur, other insights, other things would be remembered. So I would add them in the form of memos and I would regularly reread my um, past field notes and add in more reflections. So the first stage, the first phase of data analysis was during field work and it was that reflexive memoing. The, when my field work had finished, I had a sense from that reflective process that intention and withness and being autistic were all significant to what I had experienced. And I was also aware of obstructions to what I was trying to achieve. And our topic of study was identity. So I took those five sensitizing concepts of intention, witness, autism, obstruction, and identity. And I used them to index the field notes. So what I did was, uh, all the field notes were in one huge Word document divided into three stages of data collection. So in stage one, I was getting to know people. In stage two, we were working together. And in stage three, we were trying to revisit moments of significance from stage two. But those three stages blend. You know, I'm continually getting to know people through the whole process and everything sort of merges. But in terms of how I process the data, I had these three stages of field notes, huge big word documents. And I went through and I indexed for where parts of the text in stage one were significant to intention or autism or obstruction or identity or witness. And as I was doing that for stage one, I was aware that there were bits of text that were really salient, that felt really meaningful and powerful, that weren't being captured by that indexing. And so I added in three more sensitizing concepts, which were embodiment and effect and um, just an other, a hold all. And I went back through stage one and indexed for those as well. And then I went through the other two stages and indexed for all of those things. And then the, my next step within this phase of data analysis was to collect all the text from those three stage documents that was relevant to um, one of the sensitizing concepts. So for example, I would go through stage one and I would collect all the text that was relevant to intention. And then I popped that into a new document in a table. And so each little paragraph that I pulled out of the phase one, of uh, the stage one document, I put into its own little box in the table. And the table had two columns. So in the adjacent box, I would write a concise description of what was happening within that text. And that was the my first attempt at coding the data. And as I went through, I would find that the initially I was writing various concise descriptions that were pointing to the text. So I might be saying uh, she was drawn towards, drawn towards, or um, she moved away, or things like this. And, and several of them meant the same thing. And so as I carried on, I would tend to always use the best one. And so as I got further through that process, 
the little short descriptions that I was using to code that data became more consistent in their use. But I was looking to hone that. So once I'd done all of that, I'm showing you with my hands, but it will make sense in the little diagrams. You can see the little diagrams. Um, once I'd gone through and taken all the, so I've taken the text that is all little chunks, paragraphs, sentences to do with intention. I've described what's going on in each. I then took those descriptions into a new document, popped them into their own little boxes in a table, and I moved them all around so that similar descriptions were clustered together. And then I looked at how to describe them. So I pulled across into the next column, either sustained that description, if that description was the most accurate, or created descriptions that captured several of the smaller descriptions. And whilst I was doing that, I checked back with the original data to make sure that the descriptions, the new codes that I was putting into um, this second column were still as accurate or more accurate than before. And I repeated that process over and over and over again until I had, uh, until I reached a saturation point and I had a set of um, descriptors that pointed to the um, data that I'd drawn in relation to that particular sensitizing concept. As I did that, some of the sensitizing concepts merged with each other so, for example, I found that intention and effect picked up all the same chunks of um, text. So that although I'd added in effect thinking it was useful, actually I took it out again because I wasn't gaining anything by using it. And likewise, being embodied and being with also pointed to the same text, but I didn't want to drop either of those because both of those felt really significant. And so I switched it to being with, because the being is indicating the embodiment and the with is the original with that was the sensitizing concept. And you can see in the data trees on pages 82 and 83, how that has transpired. It's an at a glance for all of the different sensitizing concepts. So what you see is my topic of study in the middle the sensitizing concepts that I've used to explore the data around the outside. And then each of those has its final distilled descriptors off on the side. So sorry about the phone. By creating those data trees, I was able to see which topics were salient across all stages of data collection and those themes of being with identity, intention and obstruction are what I took forward in the work. Or being autistic was also salient but I didn't feel that it was relevant to the topic of study, it's just relevant to my experience as a researcher so I left that one aside. Once I had that overview for those themes through all the stages of the data, I compiled that into single documents that had the, the, you know, they've got the theme at the top, so being with at the top, all the descriptors that relate to that, all the codes that relate to being with, and then looking at that and looking back through the data and back through my analysis, I tried to write at the bottom of those documents just a very concise paragraph long summary of what that theme meant. And then in the next phase of the data analysis, I reviewed everything that I had so far. So I read back through the original data, I looked through the coding process, I looked at those summary documents that I generated from the data trees, and then I wrote into it. So I just opened a Word document and let myself write anything that I wanted to about what I knew about that theme. And then I wrote it again and again and again. And that redrafting process, that rethinking, there was something about the activity of actually writing it rather than just sort of sitting and thinking about it that helped me to feel for salience. So there were things, it's a really good example of O'Reilly's thing about 
the strange becoming familiar and the familiar becoming strange. So take, for example, um, the experience of restrictive practice. Within my work, I was looking to work with people who consented to work with me and who worked with me freely of their own free will. And obviously, if you are um, clipped into a chair and pushed so that you're next to me, you didn't get a choice in that. And so once restrictive practice is being used, that nullifies my opportunity to invite people to work with me of their own free will. And I have worked in specialist settings. I'm very familiar with the use of these practices. And so at first glance, that sort of restrictive practice just means, you know, well, I can't do the work at the moment. I have to wait until they're allowed to roam around freely and then I can see if they choose to be with me or not. Um, so it, it was a very minor consideration at face value, but there was something about the writing into it process where, you, where it just felt more meaningful than that. And so that writing into the data process as an embodied process allowed things that felt significant to come to the surface and be explored more. And then in the next phase of data analysis, I looked back through the 47,000 photographs that I took during my time in the field. And the photos are not data because you can't see in them the experience that was had. You know, like I am smiling in all the pictures, but I felt all sorts of different things and it's what was felt and what what was it was what was felt is the data and so I can describe what was felt in the field notes but I can't show it to you in a photo because it's not visible to you in a photo but to me those photos remind me of things that I experienced and things that I felt and so they worked to reflect on the data in a new way and they refueled that writing into the data process. So once I had looked through all the pictures again, I wrote into the data some more. And I repeated that and repeated that until I reached a point of saturation, until I have a document that says, this is what intention, the significance of intention in this work. This is what the obstructions to this work are. This is what the process of being with is. And then in the final stage, I created a, a, like an overview document, very similar to the overview document from um, stage three, phase three of the data analysis process, where I had the descriptors, the final descriptors that uh, explore, explain the themes. And some of those I updated as a result of that writing into process, just tweaking them slightly. So you have the overriding theme, like intention, and then you have the descriptors as bullet points. And then I cut them all up so that I had all these little bullet points on their own. And I spent a few days just moving them around, grouping them, clustering them. And I did that for everything, all, all the descriptors for all the different themes. And through that process, I became aware that intention and obstruction are sub-themes to the main theme of being with, and that identity stood alone as a theme. And it, it's not much of a surprise, really, because I started with two questions, and I end up with these two sets of themes, sets of findings, as it were. And yes, it's it's from that that I report the findings of this work.